Your Honor, this is Shannon Tiso. I'm an associate of uh, Dan Tom Tiso, bar number 090770, and I'll be appearing for the plaintiff today. Objection. Uh, what, what's the objection? She's not an uh, attorney in this case. Based on what? There is no reference. The representative substitution of counsel made last fall was to Antoine Tiso. If she's a member of his firm or an associate, she's free to appear. Uh, I overruled that objection. I do see um, that our, our cameraman has, has two cameras going. Uh, it was a backup. We're only having one use. Okay. As long as only one's operating, that complies with the rule. We get the second one going. It technically violates the rule. In any event, we're set to deal with a variety of things today, although really, frankly, they appear to boil down to two general areas, one being essentially issues related to the supplemental judgment that's been entered, and the other relates to the request from plaintiff, plaintiff's counsel and staff to prevent defendant from coming within 100 feet. Um, I think that fairly, very generally describes the issues we've got to deal with today. Um, I think it makes the most sense, at least from my perspective, to address that request for what's effectively a restraining order first. Um, I think it will help streamline some of the other issues. Ms. so. Um, in that request, I did not see a, a cite to any legal authority. Uh, do you have any legal basis for the court to issue such an order? So, Your Honor, what I'm relying on, and I, I understand that you're putting it under the, uh, the classification of a restraining order. What I'd be relying on is basically uh, the request to have litigants protection against proceedings. It's an Objection. unusual case where an attorney and their staff have to ask for uh, the opposing side who is in a per se in this case to stop from harassing Objection. or surveilling them. Please. And so I'm basing it on civil practice, basically. Um, I'm thinking of um, status quo orders, um, and the court has the authority to protect litigants in issues. I'm thinking about also in dependency cases or criminal cases where it's um, pretty standard practice that you don't harass, surveil um, opposing parties for um, alleged victims. And like I said, it is unusual to have to ask for it, but it, we're dealing with unusual defendants. So here's, here's frankly my concern. Without some sort of statutory authorization, I don't believe the courts um, got the authority to issue the type of order that's requested. We've got Family Abuse Prevention Act restraining orders, which are authorized by 107-700 and following. Uh, elderly Persons and Persons with Disabilities Abuse Prevention Act restraining orders, which are uh, 124-005 and following. Sex Abuse Protective Orders, which is 163-760 and following. Stalking Protective Orders, which is also 163-730 as well as ORS 3866, the Extreme Protection Orders, which are 166.525, and Emergency Protective Orders, which are 133035, which explicitly authorize the court to grant various types of relief, including a restriction of coming within certain distances. Um, in terms of harassing witnesses or leaving victims alone, those are typically provided for in release conditions, which are also authorized by the statute. Um, I, I don't see any statutory authorization for the order that's been requested. 
I don't believe the court has the authority to issue such an order in a civil case. Um, and frankly, I don't see the factual issues that are raised in the declarations that would provide the court with the authority to issue an order of restraint under any of those that I've identified. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, I'm, I'm concerned that there's no factual allegations with regard to any action towards plaintiff uh, himself, and that the others who are requesting protection aren't parties to the case, although obviously they're involved in some fashion uh, working on the case. I, I simply don't think that the court has the authority to grant such a motion um, without the statutory authority, so I'm, I'm going to deny that request. Mr. Yeah, yes, I spoke with the uh, plaintiff a couple Mondays ago, and he had no awareness of this supposed motion on his behalf. And he makes no declaration, as you've noted. I contend that this was submitted purely for delay and harassment. We have filed a motion for sanction um, regarding this restraining order. I could. Um, I mean, okay, so Mr. Tussaud supposedly has trespassed me from his office. I have honored that. Despite ORCP 9, which allows for service at a place of business or address, he supposedly has trespassed me from his office. So, so hang, hang, hang on, Mr. I, I, what I'm dealing with at this point is the request for this restraining order, which I've denied. I'm just trying to put on record some of the background of this. For, for what purpose? Uh, for, for the appellate review, uh, just to have it on record. I have I, respected I, I, his I'm request. I'm a little confused as to why you would appeal a victory. I'm not used to appealing victories. I'm not used to having victories. Okay. Well, you've got one here. I, I guess what I'm suggesting is we should move on to the other issues uh, to best use our time since yeah, I, I won on that point. I, I can just say there was no request. We are sensitive about your presence in my neighborhood. There was nothing in advance of three declarations and a motion. I understand. So that moves us on to, um, it's a variety of filings related to, primarily issues related to the uh, supplemental judgment that was entered. Um, Mr. Dyke, I'll let you, let you argue those in, um, in whatever manner you choose. No, are you talking about the supposed uh, judgment for 345? Yes, you, you filed a, a notice of objections to that. You filed a notice of judicial bias, some other notices that relate to it. Did you want to make any argument? With well, there's a notice of non-satisfaction. We have not received this. And I, 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 rec I, I did review that document recognize that you say you haven't received this letter that Mr. Tissot claims they've sent. I have letter. got nothing. All I have is on the docket some document that two months later I still haven't received. It. Okay. And that's that's not something that I can address at this point. I mean, either you've received it or you haven't. If you haven't, it's not satisfied. If you well, have, you need to sign a satisfaction. It sounds to me like your position is you haven't received it. I don't think there's anything for me to decide there. Well, the post office says because of their procedure, they let the carrier sign it. And sh I don't know. I'm sorry. Sign the satisfaction judgment. We're going to sign the uh, proof of delivery. So apparently, a postal worker signed it, and I don't know what became of it. So do I need a motion? Your Honor, I can address that. Go ahead, Ms. Tisa. Maybe it'll help us explain what's going on. And I'd like to put it on record as well. Um, it's been a long time. Due to COVID issues, we sent it immediately, um, and it was not delivered by the UPS, uh, and the check was returned to our office, I think it was a week or two ago, as refused. Okay. Objection. So typically, in my experience, they send several notices that you Objection. have uh, parts of the pickup or a letter to pick up, and if you don't pick it up or refuse to pick it up, then they send it back to the center. Objection. So my understanding is Mr. Duff refused the check. Uh, objection. 
We can stop with the objection, Mr. Dyke. Nobody's testifying. We're, we're just hearing argument. It sounds like, Mr. Dyke, they said it. For whatever reason, whether he refused it or there was some issue in the post office, he didn't get it. Her hearsay is totally contrary to my hearsay that they told me. And, and like I said, it's not something that I'm going to address today. You, the, the, at, at this point, we've got a couple of issues. One is that you filed these notices regarding the judgment to begin with. And then if this judgment stands, they, they need to get you paid. When you get paid, you need to sign a satisfaction. That's it. So they need to figure out. So the, and at this it, point, it sounds like you haven't been paid. So it won't be totally resolved until we sign a satisfaction of judgment. Once you're paid, you sign a satisfaction of judgment so that it's accurately reflected in the record that it's been paid. It's an open issue in Delaware. It is. I don't appreciate your stuff honor, that's unfounded. I guess the issue is, I would like to address this. The issue is, this has been an ongoing proceeding. Mr. Duff continues to play games. And he Objection! On the record, he doesn't sign stop as screaming. Go ahead, Mr. And he's Seth. stating on the record that he can refuse to sign the satisfaction of judgment. It's only going to further delay this issue. And so I was wondering if the court would be willing to act as an intermediary for that issue. Because giving him permission, in essence, on the record, not to sign a satisfaction of judgment, is only going to further exacerbate these issues. And it's going to keep it open, and he's going to keep filing motions. So there needs to be some end point. And I'm asking respectfully that the court intercede, make it clear, because quite frankly, Mr. Byers, he's asked several times, why, if the case is closed, why are we having a hearing? Why are we still having motions? And basically, the answer is because the court allows it to continue. So the case is closed. Why are we still entertaining these issues? I understand. Mr. Dyke, with regard to the notice issues and the supplemental judgment, did you have any argument you wanted to make regarding those? I think you've covered it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Byers, you're up. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. 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 Good morning.
I help write it. I, we, we moved the court to explain why they neglected to factor in ORC in time in finding our um, 2000, uh, February 2018 documents on time. The judgment was entered 30 of January. Okay, you count 14 days plus three days. Okay, that landed on Sunday. When you move it ahead of day, that was President's Day. You move it ahead of day, that brings us to the 18th. I filed my, my three fee documents on the 18th. And then you said these were untimely, and the opposing counsel joined in, said yes, they're untimely. I mean, first off, it says, proof of, um, ORC P9, G, the service may be made by e means of email. Uh, sorry, back up a little bit. Unless the party or party's attorney is exempted from service by email, by an order of the court, the service may be made by means of email. Opposing party has presented no orders from the court exempting them from service by email. In their substitution of counsel document, they say, it's right here, I have another copy of that. Uh, all, A-L-L, -all, A-L-L-L, -all, future correspondence to be directed to, please direct all future correspondence to Antoine Tissot at first, first, his email address, second, his street address. And the street address is someplace that I supposedly was trespassed from. So contrary to ORCP9 service in person, he's already tried to shut that down. Now, despite the substitution of counsel, I know I can't go there in person, or I should, out of respect for him, not go there in person. So for two years, I've been serving my email without any complaint. And now, it, it says right there, what is, is this supposed to have a secret meaning for attorneys that average people can't understand? Please direct all further correspondence <coughs> to, to this email address. And then you fast forward, and then Mr. Tissot says, I have not given consent to service by email. What he did that is after he accepted service by email for a number of months. So I believe it appears to be a joint attack that is not, that is not legal. I don't see that, that, that finding fault with our service by email is legal. Furthermore, ORCP 12, um, you probably know what that says. I wish I would have knew about it earlier. If I know about it earlier, I might have more understanding why there was so much allowance for their errors and their mistakes. In, regardless of errors and mistakes, I worry about not opposing errors and mistakes because it could be used against me. Nonetheless, ORPC 12, the court should overlook all trivial defects that don't affect the state. The ORCP 12, it doesn't, con it doesn't cover a non-effort. If I didn't make any effort to serve them, I don't get any benefit from ORC B12. If I make an effort and there's a technicality, I am convicted ORC B12 covers that. They have a professional legal firm. It's not like some guy in the country that doesn't know any better. They get email. They're regularly. They get professional legal email there. And for them to argue that my, uh, he, he acted like his email was down. I inquired, is your email working? And he didn't say, I'm sorry, but we had a lapse in email service. So he's made no statement that this has prejudiced Mr. Byers or harmed them in any way. I, I admittedly, in 2014, it was kind of the opposite. You, you had to get written consent to serve by email. Well, as you know, if you help author that change, it was changed. So you have old language and new language, and what we have is kind of a reworking. I believe of, it's not like we throw a whole thing out. We don't throw out this C1. We, uh, we would just modify these things. So you get this confusion over, well, okay, first it starts out saying, service by email shall be allowed unless it's a court order. But then the proof of service makes it confusing because if they consent, then proof of service is moot. If they don't consent and you can figure out how to prove email, then you don't need their consent. So uh, I, I would argue for one thing that uh, the issue about their consent only has mostly to do with 
proof of service. If they have consent, then you don't have to go through any further trouble to prove that you serve them. So, if you would like to, I challenge Mrs. Tussaud to argue why this does not, why ORCP 12 does not cover this. I assume you have more argument to make? Um, on email. Um, I, I would like you to address all your argument, the, all the issues you've raised, and then I'll give Ms. Tiso a shot, and then, then I'll make a decision with regard to where we're at. So, I mean, to me, this constitutes an entrapment. First, a tra trespass against an address where the law allows me to serve papers. That's potential entrapment. Then they're restraining order, more entrapment. It's a one by one, they're shutting down my means of service. I mean, next thing they're gonna do is they're gonna trespass me against their facts. And then I can't, I can't serve them papers. Um, email. Do you have any more on email? Uh, May 3rd, sir, email is not enough unless they have a court order against it. And I didn't know of any court that if I grant it again, any court order against it that was threatened. There's also a grammatical analysis. If you, I got contact with the English professor at Hood River. This statement, proof of, ser um, proof of service by email. If service is made by email under section B of this rule, proof of service sh shall be made by affidavit or by declaration of the person making service, comma, or by certificate of an attorney, comma, stating either that the other party has consented to service by email, on and on. So that last part is a dependent clause. Does it go with affidavit or declaration? Does it go with attorney? You know, you know, if I say you can have, you can buy this car, it can be, you can buy this car or this truck and it can be red. Okay, it's clear. Car and truck are together. Red. If I say you can buy a, a car or truck, comma, or a station wagon if it's yellow. It's like, okay, if it's yellow, why is it separated from the others if it applies equally? Make sense? You have you have affidavit declaration separate from attorney separate, and then a dependent clause. And the English anal analysis was that it's confusing. If you group them all together without the comma, affidavit, declaration, service by attorney, comma stating what it states, then there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. All three of those are together, and the last dependent clause relates to all of them. Mm -hmm. When you single out one thing, it makes it confusing. So we have a confusion. I don't know if you heard of the Oxford comma. So uh, some milk delivery people got a big settlement because of some comma. So here we are. Uh, thanks to the Oxford comma, you can make an analysis of this, and um, I also, um, in my searching for declaration of service, I searched Oregon case law, and I really couldn't find that term out of it. I, I, was, I, I don't have access to the court record. Easily. I have to come down here. And so I, I couldn't look up pro se cases and see what in the world. You know, I'd love to see what in the world most pro se people put on here. And so, as I'm the one that's doing all this, I submit a declaration of penalty of perjury on everything because I am the person authoring it and I'm in a position to declare what I say. And um, I have that as a part of my, 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 my documents and I've started using certificate slash declaration. I think certificate is a more common term and uh, you know, even in research in Oregon State Bar Book publications, I don't believe I found declaration of service out there. It's a vague, uh, not frequently used term for my research. So I've addressed, service by email, I've addressed timeliness. Um, Okay, so there was notice of regarding judicial bias. Um, we 
Let's see if I can find that. Um, okay, for, okay. The, the dispositive events, the first motion for summary judgment on claim one, it had UTCR conferral issue, but you granted it. I just listened to the 919 hearing, and I believe in that hearing, you reiterated the importance of UTCR. At the 1031 hearing, Judge Wolf stated as best as we can transcribe, the UTCR requires conferral. We have said early on, conferral's a waste of time. Antoine Tissot comes along and says the same thing. And did you throw out his? Um, you know, motion for summary judgment in October? If you treated him the same way as us, you'd say, Mr. Tissot, you said such and such, and they can test that. Where is his? It's that it. it was a separately filed. It was a separately, a separately filed UTCR certificate. Okay. Opposition to plaintiff's amended certificate pursuant to UTCR 5.1. Oh, oh. Uh, plaintiff's attorney attempts to deceive and mislead the court in representing, as an exhibit, defendant's 12 6 email wherein defendants state their intent to object as evidence in support of, I received objections that I could not resolve. I said, I intend to reject, object. I don't say, this is objection A, B, and C. He, he says, I have done my duty, apparently, and is trying to apply. I received objections that I could not resolve despite reasonable efforts to do so. He didn't even ask me what the objections were. He said, well, he claims to have object objections. I don't know what they are, but I made a reasonable effort to address them. Here's an image right here of my email and his response. Checkbox. I received ob objections that I could not resolve with the opposing party despite reasonable efforts to do so. Attached, exhibit one, is my email stating, I have objections. No reasonable effort was made to address objections by but it's not only me, it's his own word. On December 16th, Mr. Dyke emailed me his proposed judgment and dismissal. After reviewing his proposed judgment, it was clear to me from my past experiences in conferring with Mr. Dyke that no amount of effort would resolve the disagreement as to the form of judgment. For this reason, I did not waste time and energy conferring with Mr. Dyke. Early on in this dispute, I said, it is so vexatious to have to talk on the phone with Rosa and Tamara. I say, please give me the lease. And they say, this is irrelevant to the defenses of any party. I say, what do you want me to do? They say, that my, my request is irrelevant. Now you want me to have this nice conversation. More than once, you have, confirmed, you have said, the law requires, the law requires. I have to deny your motion to compel because the law requires conferral UTR. The law requires. Yes. Now he says, right there, I made reasonable effort to resolve the objections. And then he says, huh, please give me a break. It's a waste of time. He, he explained that is it, these two are not consistent. They're not consistent. Is this yet another privilege, privilege that attorneys have of just doing whatever they blank well please? And I feel, given all of the circumstances in this case, that it was not, it was reasonable not to concur. Defendants remind the court that the court did not excuse defendants from conferral despite the defendant's plain statement of how, how futile conferral can be. If the court holds the plaintiff to the same standard it imposed on the defendants, then the court must dismiss both of the dispositive events because the motion for that this is regarding the second dispositive event, the voluntary dismissal. 
And I can go back and review the first one. Um, th that Rosa, she called to confirm, and I gave her a message saying, well, I can do it next Monday. And then she lied about, I, I made a read life to confirm. Like, we, we didn't confer at all. Therefore, plaintiffs attempt to manipulate and invade UTCR 5.100 render. I think they should render ju uh, plaintiff's judgment order invalid and unacceptable. Despite ideas of plaintiff's attorney, defendants make no agreements regarding submission of proposed judgments. I took Mr. Dyke's indication that he intended to file his own proposed judgment as his agreement that each party would submit their own form. Okay, so that's our opposition to their, that's our presentation on, I wish this was federal court. I wish it's an Olympic site. Hey, we're neighbors. We all live here. And uh, this is very frustrating to be a situation where many of the people involved are our members. Not only them, but their spouses, who have regular contact with one another. I, I, I can't, I... Okay, so, do we, do I get a comment on prevailing party fees at some point? As I said, expect whatever argument you want to make today, you make it now. 